Joining us on the Connected Finance track next will be Jeremy Glassenberg from Deserve. Uh, he'll be talking to us about the API design in fintech challenges and opportunities for the next gen APIs. Uh, Deserve offers full service turnkey branded and affinity card programs and uh, definitely in this age of uh, connected finance or open finance, uh, there will be a lot to learn from him. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you right. share your screen? I am trying to do that. Looks like we got a slight freeze up here. Hmm. Almost got it. Uh, can you see my screen? Not yet. Hmm. Yep, it's coming up. Yes, uh, I can see that. There we go. That's concerningly slow, but hopefully just a loading issue. Okay. Yeah, I just noticed a brief computer slowdown. If, if that's the uh, the worst technical issue of the day, though, we should consider ourselves lucky. So let's see, let's see how this works. Right. All right. Uh, thank you for the for the yeah. intro. Welcome, everyone. All right. Can we, we good? Looks like we're good. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, for the next twenty five minutes, uh, I'll be talking about more stuff on API design in fintech, in particular the kind of challenges and trends that we're seeing in uh, the next gen fintech APIs today. So I'm gonna first talk about the history of the, uh, the modern history of fintech APIs. Then gonna some trends, patterns, and tips for those who are building APIs in fintech and wanting to um, you know, see what else is going on in the industry, what standards to, to go with. Uh, and also just where is the industry going and future opportunities in the world of fintech APIs. Uh, so first I'm gonna go into my most hated slide, uh, the where I have to talk about myself. Um, but basically I've been working on APIs in the product side of things for well over 12 years now. I'm most well known for basically starting off the developer platform as a full ecosystem over at Box and at TradeShift. Uh, those are the two unicorn companies I'm allowed to talk about. I've also consulted for many other companies uh, that have crossed unicorn status in the world of APIs. So I've dabbled in many areas, um, working on many aspects of the developer and API community. Uh, also during that time, I've supported various FinTech initiatives, including the FinTech portfolio, um, where I advise several fintech companies who are launching their APIs, an advisor to Heavybit, that's an accelerator focused just on APIs. Basically, I've worked on APIs a lot and I keep getting pulled into fintech. So currently, I'm working at a credit card platform company, uh, Deserve. They basically open up their infrastructure so that other companies who want to launch credit cards can do it much more easily with our infrastructure and the magic of APIs. So let's start to talk about FinTech APIs, where it's been and where it's going. And we're gonna start with, with the ugly. Uh, I wonder if anyone here has experienced EDI and enjoyed actually working with EDI. Says nobody ever. Actually, I, I found one person recently who does what seem to like uh, EDI. Uh, this this little red fella, yeah. Now EDI has actually a very important history in the world of fintech. It really was a good. It, it, it it's defined as the electronic interchange of business information using a standardized format. It really was a way of getting technology to talk to each other across financial services. But it's legacy technology. This stuff predated the internet. It was around at the time of mail and faxes. So it was helpful at the time, but now it's just a nightmare. And still it lingers. When I was a trade shift, I ran into it. And you know, for anyone out there who's worked with EDI recently, there's a special meetup group for you. It's um, one of those uh, you know, social groups, therapy sessions, group therapy sessions. Those who've had to deal with, with EDI maybe have a PTSD from it. Just kidding, but um, we did see for many years standards in the world of FinTech APIs, but just like SOAP to rest, there's a lot there that you just don't want to deal with, and it was limiting. 
many of us on the consumer side experienced another challenge. For those who ever used mint.com, there are other tools like personal capital today. These are those personal finance services where they let you connect all of your bank accounts and credit card info. And they show you, they give you a nice financial summary, a financial overview of where you are and your, um, you know, uh, your transactions and just giving you some future prospects too, to where things are going for you. It's just personal financial tracking. Well, back in the day, um, going back 12 years, uh, Mint had this problem of APIs also just not being there. So in order to connect to your bank accounts, they had to site scrape. So they had to actually ask you for your username and password to every one of your bank accounts, and you had to trust that Mint wasn't going to do something very, very wrong with those. In addition to the security issues here, uh, there were many issues of just reliability and usability, because what Mint would have to do is site scrape. They take your information, log into your account, and pull information from the websites. This was not reliable. It broke all the time. If you change your password for your bank, this thing would go haywire. Um, basically, Mint did what it could when the experience just was very poor because we didn't have enough APIs over in the banking world. And why was that? Well, while APIs were exploding from 2009 onward, we just didn't see much happening in the banking industry. I've seen a few companies here or there try to encourage banks to have APIs, but you know what? Why don't we talk to some of the banks and see what, what they thought at the time? Yeah, this was basically the bank's reaction to APIs and making data accessible. Banks were a bit behind on other companies who figured out that you don't need to be in control by having full control of your data and keeping it to yourself. Other companies learned about the power of sharing and using APIs to make information more accessible to build an ecosystem. Banks weren't a fan of that. And so they made things very difficult while APIs were taking off in other industries. But then something happened. Basically, government regulation happened, both in the US and in Europe. Uh, open banking, you're hearing a lot about that today, open banking, which you know, is basically saying that banks need to make their data generally accessible to their users. They have to go from private data to open data. It didn't explicitly say that you had to have APIs, but APIs was really the obvious solution to this new requirement. Um, there's also over from Europe, the PSD2, that's new regulation for uh, electronic payment services. It basically was about making payments more secure in Europe, but also to boost innovation and to encourage banks and other financial services just adapt to new technologies. In other words, there was just this government pressure and regulations that was saying, you should probably just open up APIs. That's gonna make this all a lot easier. So this started to create opportunity. And we're gonna come back to this. I wanna talk about other things that were happening in the world of FinTech. But I have to note here, these regulations basically pushed financial services, the financial industry, to open up through APIs. But they didn't say exactly how those APIs had to work. And we're going to come back to that. But once this happened, now we can move from site scraping that Mint had to do to APIs with OAuth that companies like Plaid get to utilize. So now if you want to connect a new tech company to, with a bank account, we don't have to share our passwords. We can just go to Chase, log in with Chase. Chase will let us choose what data to share. The magic of OAuth with authorization, everything is shared through APIs. What do we have? We have an, an integration then, an experience that's more usable, also more reliable and more secure. In other words, it's really quite a groovy time. And besides the banks opening up, we had seen in parallel many other opportunities uh, coming on in FinTech and opening up APIs. There was a lot going on, especially in the world of uh, payments um, and with cards and now credit cards. Uh, but basically while banks were being difficult and eventually forced to open up, these other companies had seen the benefit of, of APIs and FinTech and 
really raked in the benefits. So we're now seeing in the world of fintech, the biggest companies are APIs. Uh, we're also seeing that in the world of APIs, some of the bigger companies are fintechers. In other words, it's basically a very good time to be in fintech APIs. At the same time, these companies execute very, very well in APIs. So if you're entering the space, there's a high bar. Uh, there's a lot that you could have gotten away with uh, when building out a developer experience that maybe wasn't, that maybe was good, not great. But in the world of fintech, well-designed APIs and a good overall developer experience is just more and more expected with the standard that's been set. After all, Stripe is actually known for being the founder of that three column API documentation that basically everyone is using for their API documentation for now. We're seeing that these FinTech companies really are the thought leaders in developer experience and establishing the right standards. So if you're entering this space, yeah, remember there's a high bar. At the same time, you have a lot of good benchmarks. You can check out all these companies, Plaid, Stripe, Square, Marketa, review their APIs and learn from them in order to just build a set of high quality APIs and a good developer experience right at the start. Now I wanna come back also to that topic of standards, especially if we're looking at these top-notch APIs today. And yeah, there are actually industry standards in FinTech APIs. Unfortunately, we have to go back to some of those legacy APIs. ISO 222, it's, uh, that goes back to EDI, that stuff that I hope you don't have to work with. Uh, there's also a lot when it comes to messaging standards. I'm working on this at, uh, at Deserve, it's basically when you are handling credit card transactions, what happens from the point of sale device to the issuing bank, um, and just all the operations that happen in between, between the, the point of sale, the processor, the network, the issuer. Uh, how do you send transaction messages across? So this is a lower level messaging, it's important, but let's come back to the world of APIs of enabling those easier experiences, higher level, uh, the plaids, the squares, where you, know, you can utilize REST or GraphQL. What are the standards there? Well, in actuality, when it comes to standards and consistency in FinTech APIs, it's still a case that you know, they're not really rules, they're more guidelines out there. Uh, many in the world of APIs have that dream of seeing APIs consistent, not just according to the RESTful standard, but across companies, seeing the same kind of endpoint definitions, object definitions, seeing patterns when you're working with various APIs, if in the same industry, you can reuse a lot of your code because things are just the same. We are seeing some of that in banks because with the pressure for open API, companies like Swift, that are helping those banks create APIs, they're establishing consistent APIs across the board. Um, but for other fintech companies serving different use cases, we're hoping to see more. And it's understandable, many of these companies are actually relatively new in the world of APIs, and they're still figuring themselves out. So we're not seeing that consistency yet. We are seeing some patterns. And uh, that's what I'd like to go into next. What are the patterns? What are the trends? What may come along? next so we're going to review some of these this is both to see really what is the bar what standards do you need when you're building a fintech api and while you're there what can you do to support the establishment of consistency across fintech apis so let's look at first where there is some consistency when it comes to properties individual properties and parameters or outputs you do see certain patterns basically all the main popular fintech APIs are doing the same thing when it comes to currency. They've all figured out that currency should just be an integer value. Uh, for, US, for US currency, it basically goes down to cents. Um, just using integers, easy to calculate, they're easy to store. This is pretty consistent. We're seeing a few properties like this, day, time, pretty much they're all using the same thing. Currency codes, they're all using the same thing. Unfortunately, it's easier to make your properties consistent than it is to make your endpoints 
and your objects consistent. So here's where we start to already see different structures for maybe similar properties, similar areas of our APIs. Stripe and Briquetta start to diverge. Um, also, this is where we're seeing companies dabble in GraphQL over a Braintree, for example. So it's probably gonna be a while before I get that sort of consistency. I still recommend when you're building your API, see what they're all doing, make certain decisions for yourself. And once you make those decisions, whatever you do, keep consistency in your own API. Of course, staying restful or going with GraphQL certainly helps. But again, this is a case where I just continue to benchmark, see what companies are doing, see as they iterate. You may see additional trends and object definitions so that the endpoints and the objects become more consistent over time. Uh, going a little bit higher level than just the API structure, there are certain patterns, trends that we just see, and basically they're strategies, what you need to prioritize for your APIs, like item potency. Uh, basically, when someone is making a payment, uh, if that post request doesn't return success, and they're not sure if it went through or not, that's a really uncomfortable place to be in, because you have money floating around. So you're definitely seeing item potency a lot. Basically, when someone makes a post request, they want to have a way of making sure that it went through. If it doesn't go through, they're going to make it again, but they don't want a duplicate request. They won't want to be double charged. So yeah, you're seeing that across the board, the need item potency in your post requests. Also, when it comes to security, authentication, authorization, we're seeing some patterns. Some of these are the obvious. Yep, OAuth really is a standard. Uh, at least OAuth is for anything that is client to server. Um, we also see here that in the world of OAuth 2, where you don't officially need um, an API secret encrypted signature in all of your API calls, the FinTech companies pretty much all have that as well as part of their, their standard. Um, now, Something I still have to emphasize though, most of these companies, they have a client to server integration where maybe you have a mobile app, you have something consumer facing, they're even giving you some code samples um, to manage that interaction with your user, be it a consumer payment or connect with your bank account like Plaid has. Uh, these are the client to server experiences. But there's also a lot of just behind the scenes server to server use cases. And in those cases, yeah, you don't really need OAuth. So that's where you just see basic authentication. This is very common where a user is connecting to maybe a mobile app, but for security, that mobile app isn't going straight to the third-party API. It's going to the partner or the customer's own server, and then from there, a call is being made to the API. Maybe in the case of Marketa, they're completely behind the scenes. So when this happens, you don't necessarily need the OAuth experience. The partner manages their authentication uh, with the user, and then they can just do basic auth with the partner in the, in the server. And uh, yeah, here it's just, you know, you don't necessarily need OAuth. But there are some other things that we're seeing. Actually, before I get to the next bit, I should note that some of the fintechers, like Marketa, they have something called Marketa.js, Stripe has Stripe Connect. You'll actually see in their APIs then basic authentication and OAuth. They understand to use OAuth for anything that's clearly a client to server interaction, but if they have both client to server and server to server, they're going to have actually basic auth and OAuth there. Now, even when it comes to server to server or client to server, just like in potency, a serious, serious priority I've seen across the board is that of authorization along with authentication. Basically, you'll need to have some sort of administrative, even server to server APIs, it's common to have that administrative functionality to create users, to manage users, but at the same time, make sure there's a way of delegating so that you have auth tokens, access tokens that only give you access at the user level. So you can perform operations on behalf of the user with a granular level of security. This one sometimes is actually debated. For some APIs, you'll really see more of a focus on the admin tokens 
that's usually where it's more of an infrastructure focus or the operations are more about creating users than really performing operations on behalf of the users. When you are performing on behalf of the users, it's also very common actually to have these single use tokens. Uh, some have also argued there's something called PCI compliant, uh, PCI compliance, that's payment card industry compliance. Yeah, in our world, there are a lot of industry regulations when it comes to security and also privacy. Within PCI, there's a general rule to restrict access to cardholder data on a need to know basis. So some argue that when it comes to the API, you really need to have strong authorization to make sure that access tokens are providing limited access to user information. Also, one last bit that we see as really a consistency, not in the API endpoint definitions themselves, but when you are trying to build an app that involves credit cards or bank accounts, and you're reporting a credit card is lost or stolen, or you're making a payment, or you're transferring money in and out, you don't want to do this live. Because, yeah, if you make mistakes, you know, people lose money. That sucks if you're doing that even when you're just testing. So, yeah, everyone figured out that they needed to have more than just mock APIs, but they also need to have uh, a sandbox for testing. Some way of just trying out your financial transactions, reporting cards as lost or stolen without actually reporting a card as lost or stolen. So there's some obvious patterns that we see in the developer experience to make for a quality API. Some patterns in the API definitions and they're in closing. So I encourage you to keep a lookout and see as these popular API companies continue to iterate and maybe seemingly try to get their APIs more consistent. There are other initiatives that I'm seeing to support that vision of getting consistent APIs across FinTech to make it even easier to work together. And Plaid, I think is a great example of incentivizing, of motivating companies to have consistency in their APIs. Uh, after building a great consumer experience to connect, let users connect with their bank accounts, with their credit cards and other financial institutions, well, um, they, Plaid said, well, let's and make it easier for their partners to integrate. And they said, hey, yeah, here's our open system, the Plaid Exchange. All you have to do is create APIs that are aligned with our definition. We're going to say how the APIs need to look. If you can make the APIs consistent like that, yeah, you can easily integrate with us because we're then connecting with a bunch of different banks, all with the same APIs. That's the dream. And so I hope that over time we see more fintech companies doing what they can, both watching the market and doing what they can to encourage other financial institutions and financial services to make APIs that are consistent as the fintech industry continues to grow. So thank you all for putting up with me for 20-ish minutes. I just want to emphasize, let's try to keep that bar high, collaborate with other experts in the world of, a of fintech APIs, and hopefully we will have over the next few years even, even better fintech API ecosystem than we do today. Thank you again. Are there any questions? Uh, hi, Jeremy. Yep, uh, that was a great session. I uh, haven't received any questions yet from the audience. Uh, I, I do have one though. So uh, I'm sure there are uh, quite a lot of uh, people in the audience who uh, are looking at learning, uh, who are from the technical side, who are uh, trying to learn things and try to make a career in the fintechs. So uh, what would be that top two or three skills that you would advise them to uh, you know, uh, gather up to have a good time? So, so to have a good career in, in fintech, you know, I've hired both product managers and developer advocates. Of course, I've worked with, with many engineers. Um, I always say that the best team members just are high in empathy. Uh, I really look for empathy-driven type A's in general. But that's general advice. When it comes to getting a job in FinTech or in APIs in general, you know, the, the, it, APIs is an easy place to work on side projects and just get your own experience working on APIs. There are so many platforms out there with open APIs you can just work on, you can integrate with. 
Uh, when I was in college, I was built, I was working on whatever API I could find. I was hacking away at this thing called iGoogle. It was a random set of Google APIs to create a custom homepage on Google. Um, I later worked with messaging APIs. And even today, when I'm managing a team, I'm still working on side projects. So I've built a tool that allows people when they're building, when they're defining an API, an open API, to generate much of the API schema themselves. There's plenty of opportunity to create something that's open source, find an API you like, and just build an integration to get experience with APIs. And that gets you into the space um, with experience and you know through Karma. You've hopefully built something that helps somebody else in the process. Great. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for that. I hope this is uh, this was really helpful to a uh, couple of guys in the audience. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Yeah. It's great to be here. Take care, everyone.